night, <clears throat> quietly opens the door to the bedroom. From under the blanket, she sees four legs instead of just her husband's two. So she gets a baseball bat and starts bashing a blanket as hard as she can. When she's done, she goes down to the kitchen to get something to drink. She sees her husband sitting there reading a magazine. He says, hi, darling, your parents have come to visit us, so I let them stay in our bedroom. <laughs> Did you say hello? <laughs> well, I guess she said a little more than hello, didn't she? <laughs> Luke 5, 17. Well, it starts with verse 17, and it goes to verse 26, but I'm just going to read this first one for a, a, a second here. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. And continuing in verse 17, they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for these morsels of your word, which you have given and which come down to us. And we pray that you will guide and direct these morsels to where you would have them to go and that they would cause the effect that you would have them to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So he was teaching... And the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. And so Jesus was sharing powerful insights, as he always did. People were enthralled to hear what he was saying. He was the most powerful teacher, preacher, that there ever was. The word was from him and was about him. And no one could have insight into Scripture like he had. <clears throat> and these people had come a long way to hear what he had to say. Some were nearby and some were from other places, but they, some of them had come a long way. And some came to learn, and some came to be inspired, and some came to try to catch him in a statement of action they could use against him. <clears throat> and they, that is the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they had thought they had a corner on scripture and doctrine. They thought they knew more than anyone else could possibly know. And they thought that nothing new or outside of their authority could be acceptable. They, they weren't looking as they sat there to learn something new about God. They were there to observe and to try to catch Jesus in some doctrinal, what they thought would be an error, so they could use that against him. And it said in continuing verse 17, they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, which was quite a little ways away. And the power of the Lord who was with Jesus to heal the sick. Of course, the power to heal was always with Jesus. But on this day, God's power to heal was especially manifested. There were times when Jesus couldn't heal very many because of their unbelief. But this day, that power was manifested. And in verse 18, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. So think about these guys. They were so concerned about their buddy that they carried him who knows how far. Could have been across the street. Could have been a nearby town. But they loved their friend. They loved him. They wanted him to be made whole. And they believed that Jesus had the power to do that. And verse 19, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. In those days, rooftops were used for certain things. In those days, they, they had uh, storage up there. And there was a, usually a stairway that went to the top of the roof. 
but they had to carry him up that stairway and the roof they were made of a wooden frame and then a layer of straw then a layer of clay that was tamped down with a stone roller the clay layer would have been what was referred to as tiles so if you think about it jesus may have built some of those roofs he was a builder he was a carpenter after the fashion of his of his earthly dad so he could have built some things like that. And um, so they probably had storage jars up there and different things. But in Mark chapter 2, it says they dug through the roof. They put it that way. And it says some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carrying by, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. It took four men to carry their paralyzed friend. They made him a hole in the roof. It had to be a pretty good sized hole. And they lowered him down, had to be with ropes. And, he, and that, that hole in the roof was right in front of Jesus. You know, think of everyone in there seeing dust and debris coming down from the ceiling. What's going on? Earthquake? Maybe. Is the roof caving in? Probably not. Think of the faith of these four friends. It would have been much harder to lift their friend back up out of the hole if he wasn't healed. Gravity was, it, there was a gravity assist in lowering him down. And they had faith that he was gonna be healed so they wouldn't have to hoist him back up again. That's faith. And then, G and then in verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Have you ever heard that? Maybe not in those exact words, but we've all had that. We're all his friends and our sins are forgiven. So here are the four friends looking down through a hole in the roof. <laughs> And they knew that Jesus can heal. They knew that. Now they want to see how he's going to do it. They've done their part. They brought him from wherever. They carried him. They made the effort. They carried him up on the roof. I don't know where they got the ropes, but they had some ropes. And they lowered him down. And now it's all up to Jesus. They did their part. It's up to him. And he starts talking about sins. What's going on? We made all this effort. Carried our friend, made a hole in the roof. Probably going to have to patch up that hole or pay for it or hire somebody to, to do it. Our friend needs healing and you're talking about sins. He needs to walk. He needs to be able to work and make a living. And Jesus is talking about sins. But to Jesus, sin is more damaging than any other kind of sickness. Because sin is a sickness. Sin has eternal consequences. The damage of sin reaches to eternity. Paralysis is over. Jesus first addressed the most serious problem. Sin. Then he healed the man's body. I had a call on Thursday at supper time. I was just making supper and I got a call from a lady in our home church down in Altoona. The pastor is down in uh, Dominican Republic. He's been down there for a few days. And there, uh, this man was uh, in the Altoona hospital and didn't have long to live. And so she asked me if I'd go over there. She was a she was related through marriage to him. And I remember the guy, I could remember him and his family. And so of course, I'll go over there. And I went up there and he was had on a ventilator, unresponsive. 
and I prayed for him that his passing would be a comfort a comforted one and I prayed for the family and um, most of them I had known in church before he had a twin brother that I never knew but he was a born-again believer and God called him home that was the first thing I asked because he know the Lord is he up to date and they said yes he's accepted Christ as his Savior that's always the first thing I ask if I go in the hospital and somebody's on their deathbed and he passed yesterday morning so he's in heaven now but if I go in and visit someone like that the first thing I tell him I says you sometimes I don't even know them a friend or a relative asks me to go see them I see I say you probably aren't going to survive this and I came here to get you ready to meet God and I've had several I say, do you want to receive Christ as your Savior? And they said, yes, I do. Those three words are the most precious things you can, a soul winner can ever hear. And some of them, then I preached their funeral. Didn't know them. But I, but I had known this man. I didn't recognize him. He was ravaged by cancer since 2018. And um, I had photographed, his wife told me that I had photographed almost everybody in that room their senior pictures <laughs> I took her pictures and her daughter's pictures and almost everybody in that room I had photographed so they all knew me they knew who I was even before I was a minister but the Lord heals the worst sickness that you can have that's the sickness of sin so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, verse 21, began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, they didn't even speak their question. Or maybe here is something we can use against him. They were only thinking it. But in, but in Psalm 94, 11, it says, The Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. <laughs> so then in verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Why are you thinking these things in your hearts, he said. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? No one can do anything that God doesn't know about. God, he, he knows the plans you have. He knows what you're thinking. Even though they never escape from your lips as words, your thoughts are known by God. Amen. <laughs> Verse 24, but I want you to know, Jesus said, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So Jesus demonstrated three things. His compassion, Matthew 9, 36, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion for the paralyzed man. But the paralyzed man was also a sinner. He had compassion for the sinner. And we've all experienced that. He had compassion for the four friends. He had compassion for those who were in attendance, both the faithful and the skeptics. He had compassion for them all. His authority, he demonstrated, over the physical world. He healed ailments that could not be healed by physicians or by the medicines of the day. No one else could do that except in God's power. Elijah could do it in God's power. Elisha could do it in God's power. And after the Holy Spirit came, the apostles could do it, but only in God's power. And we pray and see people healed, but only in God's power. It's God that does the healing. Only God. And Jesus was God. 
And he had the authority and the power to interfere with nature. Natural laws are subject to him. He created it. He owns it. God can do miracles and only God. Jesus did plenty of them. We don't even know about most of them. And third, he demonstrated his ability to forgive sin. Because sin is an offense against God. Only God can forgive the sin. Jesus would pay the penalty for all the sins of mankind. He paid the penalty for the roof diggers. He paid the penalty for the attendees. He paid the, pen the penalty for the Pharisees and teachers of the law who were sitting there in judgment over him. He even paid the penalty for the sinner in this pulpit today. Even with the demonstration of miracles, <clears throat> some still refused to believe. This was a standing room only crowd, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, sitting in judgment. The victory, verse 25, immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. He was healed from sin, and he was healed from his paralysis, and he picked up the mat, which must have had some kind of a framework to it, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen a remarkable, we have seen remarkable things today. They had never seen they they came there because he was a miracle worker. But seeing somebody tear a hole in the roof and lowering their friend down, and Jesus said, Your sins are forgiven, and then proving himself to the skeptics, and the guy gets up and he's paralyzed. Paralysis usually has atrophication with it. The muscles shrink and they're not useful anymore. But he got up, picked up the mat, and left. How about that? All these people were amazed. So they didn't let the structure get in the way. They had to get their friend to Jesus. There are physical structures, like a roof, like a door, like a wall, like people in the way. To get to the other side, you have to move or remove the structure. Dig through it, poke a hole in it, blow it up, or whatever you have to do. But there are structures that keep you from reaching God sometimes. There are. There could be well-meaning people with incorrect understanding of Scripture keeping you from God. That's, that's, just, that's a barrier. There could be evil people trying to destroy the work of God in you. Persecution can come from your own family. And it often does. Peer pressure is a structure, a barrier Satan uses to keep young people from God. So don't let the structure keep you from God. These four friends had carried this man to Jesus. Then he, they knew that he needed a healing that only Jesus could do. The first barrier or structure they encountered was the people. The crowd was impenetrable for them. They, the crowd wouldn't step aside. If you just were there by yourself, you could probably turn sideways and give an elbow here and there and maybe get your way through. But they four of them were all tethered together with the fifth man on this, on this uh, cot or whatever it was, a mat they call it. But they wouldn't step aside. They wanted to hear what Jesus was saying. They didn't miss anything. They were a barrier and they wouldn't help they were keeping the paralytic from Jesus. The only people sitting down there were the Pharisees. The know-it-alls had their comfort. They rested in their own knowledge and attitudes. Jesus was carrying something new. 
and the and um, these people didn't want to hear it. The crowd wanted to hear it, but the Pharisees didn't. They were trying to catch him. But there was standing room only. So you might have to break through a structure or penetrate a barrier. If your friends at work or school think you're a weirdo because you follow Christ, you might have to stop associating with them or use the word to, to conquer them. If life's trials are leading you to doubt God, and that happens, tear that structure down. There are storms of doubt that come along because of things we go through. Where's God? Why, why aren't you helping me with this? Leading you to doubt God. Some, some spend more time with their concerns than they do with God. So spend more time with God. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Cultivate Christian friends, believer friends that you can call and call on. Rise above it. Instead of dwelling on the problems of life, and there are many, people of our vintage have had lots of problems in life, except for that youngster we have over in the corner there. <laughs> She has seen her share of problems, too. Don't let people, situations, aches, pains, bills, or, every, or anything else, keep you from accomplishing what God wants you to do. Hold on tight and don't let go. The apostles were all martyred except for John. But they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop. Some of the best church services are the ones that you didn't want to go to. I'm too tired. I got a headache. I don't want to go to this service. And then you go and you find out that that was an awesome service. And there was a spiritual breakthrough for you. And if you'd have just listened to your own tiredness, you wouldn't have gone. And that's a barrier. Sometimes you're too tired to read your Bible. But you read it anyway, you press through that. You tear a hole in that roof. The word was just what you needed right then. And you weren't going to open it and read it. The enemy doesn't want you to get through. Knock that barrier down. Wait a minute. Maybe I don't have to tear that barrier down. Maybe Jesus will tear it down for me. Sometimes I just can't seem to get anywhere in my prayer life. Sometimes we can't seem to carry our friends to Jesus. It doesn't work. They won't come. Sometimes life seems too hard. Terrible things happen to good people, including Christian believers. There are times when you can't dig a hole in the roof or rise above that barrier. There are times when you can't seem to remove the obstacles. Those are times when you do this. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 11. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. That's a good, that's a good scripture for when you can't seem to penetrate. Verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. See, we do have sufferings. We all, I mean, I know what's wrong with every one of you. <laughs> Except for Jennifer. I know I know how to pray. For, and I pray for everybody in here twice a day. Because I know right where your aches are and everything. I know. From Well, Richie doesn't have any. I pray for him anyway. I pray for you anyway. But the rest of us, I know where your aches and pains are. I know you. 
And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. That's what you do when you can't seem to get through that barrier. When you can't, when you need a hole in the roof because nobody will let you into Jesus. When you just can't seem to get there. That's what you do. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. And he may lift you up. But this is in due time. That's when he wants to do it. We, we get impatient with God. But it says in due time. But cast your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. I was watching, I wrote this sermon yesterday, and I, or well, day before yesterday, and yesterday, and I, I was looking, I was watching Perry Stone this morning, I think it was this morning, and he was on one of his tours that he takes to the Holy Land, and they were in Capernaum, which is where this took place. And then and there, were, there was a lot of um, excavations of structures that were the houses of the people that lived around there. And in the distance, there was a big, um, big shelter like over top of one of the houses that they were digging up. And he said, they say that that right there is Peter's house. And they think that this took place in Peter's house. Well, I don't know. That's a tradition or something. I don't know. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But it's an interesting thought that it happened in Peter's house. And it was the house was right near the sea. And he was a fisherman. And his trade was around Capernaum there. But Perry Stone came to the conclusion of the same as I did, that sometimes it's hard for you to get through the barrier of prayer and of scripture and of attending because you just don't feel what like or you're weary or you just can't seem to get there and that's the times when you have to really double down and do it amen double down and do it would you stand with me lord this morning we thank you for the precious truths in your word and for the and for the heart of uh, of this lesson the scripture today and we just ask that it uh, stays with us and inspires us to to do what you want us to do or and, and to press through and to rise above the barriers or push them out of the way or blow them up or do whatever we have to do to get to Jesus. And sometimes, Lord, when we just can't, then we're going to humble ourselves to you. And Jesus will take care of those barriers, Lord. We trust you'll do that. Bless your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters.